for the final presentation on this series of videos about uh, voluntary disclosures and motivations uh, and pressures that come from society and important stakeholders, we're going to look at institutional theory. So institutional theory um, has been around for a long time and it's been very popular in economic, social theory and political theory. It shares a lot in common with legitimacy theory and it understands that institutions must interact with its surrounding social systems. However, where legitimacy theory um, is focused on the feelings and perceptions of society towards the firm, the institutional theory is much more interested in how the firm interacts inside, how it copes with um, the pressures from society. So a quick definition of an institution uh, cited within your Deegan textbook is it's comprised of regulative, normative and cultural cognitive elements that together with associated activities and resources provide stability and meaning to social life. So that's a fairly high level idea of what an institution is. And we need to examine those three areas. So the elements of an institution, the regulative pillar are the rules, laws and associated sanctions. In other words, what happens to if you break their rules and laws? Society expects that institutions will live by the rules or else. So we have the rules of society, meaning the law, uh, and also the laws, the policies, the ways that an institution um, lives with inside itself. There's a normative pillar, and these are the norms and values that go right through the institution and give it its ethics, its individuality. I'll start that again. Its individuality and its personality. These are the norms and values that give it ideas of the proper way to behave. Finally, there is the cultural cognitive pillar. Uh, and these are often the things that are taken for granted as ways of getting things done. Uh, these are how, society, how a firm sits within a society. So for example, um, a company like Woolworths, which came from America, has learned to live by society's rules and expectations. It talks the language of society. Um, it provides its products in ways that society has become familiar with. Uh, it will be interesting to see how that giant company from America, um, Amazon, will fare when it moves to Australia. Certainly other companies have come from America uh, and have taken very little, paid little attention to uh, this cultural cognitive side of doing business. So think of um, Starbucks, for example. They were going to come here and teach us how to sell coffee in Australia and they failed dismally. Probably because um, they paid little attention to this cultural cognitive side of doing business. There are dimensions, two dimensions uh, to institutional theory that are of great interest to us. The first is isomorphism. Uh, this is a constraining process where an institution changes to resemble other institutions in the same environmental conditions. For example, if you choose to fly with Qantas, you'll have a very similar experience uh, if you suddenly choose to fly Virgin. They are domestic and international airlines and the way they shape themselves, the way they present themselves to you, the services they provide, their governance structures, are all very similar. They've come to resemble each other because they've worked out the best way of doing business in that industry. Uh, the opposite is where is called decoupling. This is where an organisation presents itself to society as saying, look at us, we're really good social citizens, you should do business with us, but behind the scenes, they've actually broken away from that. And that doesn't mean that they're doing things illegally or unethically, but 
quite often it does. And so the best example I could think of that would be Enron, uh, the Amer giant American company that held itself up as uh, a leader in innovation. Um, they had aspirations of being the greatest company in the world. But behind the scenes, they began to be ruled by greed and self-interest. And in the end, uh, it was the greed and self-interest that brought them undone. There was a total decoupling between the company that would present that was presented to the world and the company that was. So isomorphism, um, there are a number of ways that an institution will change to meet social expectations. Uh, for example, coercive isomorphism occurs when the institution changes its pra practices because of pressure from its dominant stakeholders. There is mimetic isomorphism where companies will adopt the practices of other successful institutions within their industry. And so they can't help but come to resemble them. And then there is normative isomorphism where normative groups or norm, norm creators, pressure groups, will pressure institutions to adopt what they see as normal behavior. And we're seeing examples of this right now uh, with activist groups getting a real um, toehold into the way banks do business in Australia. And again, with decoupling, sometimes uh, institutions simply want to do the isomorphism bit as a bit of window dressing. Look at us, aren't we great? We're the darlings of society. We are doing so much to help mining communities, for example. We are doing so much to help other um, good causes within society. But behind the scenes, perhaps the reality is not matching uh, the spin. And so we could have an example of decoupling. And so as a wrap up, uh, institutional theory has a more macro viewpoint than the other theories presented here. Um, Accounting theorists consider institutional theory because of its ability to track accounting decisions in relation to the institution's need for social acceptance. Conformity and change are large aspects of accounting decision making under this theory. However, you need to understand that there are large overlaps with legitimacy and stakeholder theory. So each of those three theories quite clearly work together each, uh, quite closely. There is a lot of overlap. And at different times, one theory might explain uh, the disclosures that a firm makes much better than the others. So that's my series of presentations on why firms might choose to make voluntary disclosures based on pressures from society. I hope you've enjoyed them. And in the next module, we're going to look at um, environmental, social, and um, sustainable reporting. Bye for now.